We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everybody. My name is Natalia Lungo, and on behalf of the Secretariat of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, I would like to welcome all the participants to this workshop jointly organized by the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network and the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Before we begin the session, I would like to share a few housekeeping updates. Attendees are welcome and encouraged to turn the video on and to use the chat function to introduce themselves with their names, affiliation, and country. Today's session also allows interactions from the audience. To suggest questions for the panelists during the Q&A, we ask attendees to use the raise hand function in the Zoom platform. Attendees will be then uh, invited to take the floor and will be given the opportunity to unmute the microphone. I now invite Martin Fullin, the Director of Operations and Knowledge, um, and Knowledge Partnership of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network to begin today's workshop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia, and welcome to all. Uh, thank you also to all those of you who have uh, found our session today in person uh, in Katowice, which we greatly appreciate. Unfortunately, many of us cannot be with you there, but rest assured that we hopefully will have a very engaged and nice discussion either way. So as mentioned, I'm the Director of Operations and Knowledge Partnerships of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, and also I'm working with the Datasphere Initiative, which we are currently incubating um, at this structure. Um, the goal of our work has been um, not only since the inception of the Policy Network in 2012, but also uh, since we launched uh, first global status report in 2018 and 19 to bring regional voices into debates on digital policy making. And um, at the IGF in Berlin um, in 2019, we launched the first global status report on digital policy trends and followed this by a Latin American regional status report in cooperation with UNECLAC. And we also recently launched a project on cross-border digital policies for Africa to help frame map and address cross-border digital policies across the African continent, which we are working on with also the African Union and also with thanks of the very gracious support by the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. To uh, complement these efforts, uh, the purpose of this workshop is to gather now uh, regional stakeholders to share with us initiatives that are also leveraging the sustainable uh, digital transformation in the Global South and to help us outline ways um, to build more inclusive digital cooperation. Um, today we will discuss how to advance global digital cooperation as well as the different instruments and tools uh, stakeholders need to effectively cooperate uh, around internet governance challenges. And we hope to address some of uh, the following key uh, policy questions through um, different angles. So firstly, what we will be interested to discuss is how can we promote a free, secure, an open internet to enable digital participation and make use uh, from the potential digital transformation um, that surrounds us. What necessary legal, regulatory, institutional frameworks need to be in place? And uh, of course, what is the role of data governance as an underlying aspect in leveraging a sustainable and uh, digital transformation? And uh, in order for um, us to discuss this in a well-informed manner, we have a great panel joining us today uh, that is lined up and it's my my pleasure to introduce them now quickly in one go and then again individually so um, co-organizers uh, today of the session with us um, are our dear colleagues from the united nations economic commission for latin america and the caribbean namely georgina nunez reyes who is economic affairs officer uh, at UNECLAC, and also mr edwin fernando Rojas, who is a senior economic affairs assistant um, thank you so much for joining us all the way virtually from Chile. Uh, we will also be joined today by Mr. Christian uh, Minungu, who is head of division uh, for infrastructure and energy at the African Union. Um, we are very excited to have you with us. Nena Nakama, chief web advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation, um, whom you, many of you know for sure. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nena. We'll also be joined by Didier 
uh, Nuri Kimfura, who is uh, Director of Technology and Innovation um, at Smart Africa. And last but not least, uh, we are also very excited to have with us today Maria Fernanda, uh, first vice chair, coming to us from the International Chamber um, of Commerce. Um, and with this, uh, I would like to then start the first uh, part um, where we will try to discuss in the next half hour, in particular, the regulatory environment um, that is uh, of utmost relevance in context of a sustainable digital transformation. So um, really, um, we would like to understand how we can promote a free, secure and open internet to enable digital participation and how to make use um, of all of those potentials uh, for this approach and what the regulatory institutional frameworks might be needed. So for this, um, I would now like to give the floor uh, to Nena Nakwama, um, as said, uh, joining us as Chief Web Advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation. And um, we would be greatly interested, Nena, to hear in the next five minutes your perspectives on the question of regulatory environment. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everyone. And I hope you can hear me very well and see me. Uh, hello from Katowice. Um, I have a, I want to say that this very session is important to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be staying up this late for it. Um, for the past three days, we've been discussing around the free, open, and uh, interoperable internet, and this is for me an extension of of that discussion. So I have, I have only five minutes to give you my initial thoughts and we can come back to it. And the question of the how and what we should be doing is central. So I'd like to talk about the how. This is the 16th edition of the Internet Governance Forum. And I think um, I and Jay, you've been around for five, six years now. And you've been doing a lot of work um, uh, bringing together stakeholders. So if you forget everything I, I'm saying in the next five minutes, remember this word multi-stakeholder. Um, this is what INJ has been doing. This is what IGF has been doing. This is what the contract for the web has been doing. This is what I believe that the UN in its digital cooperation agenda has also been doing. So it is very important that we realize that there will not be a time when government alone will be able to solve the problem of a free and open internet, because the government alone did not invent the internet. There will not be a time when industry alone will solve the problem of the free and open internet, because industry alone does not uh, uh, control the internet. And there will not be a time uh, when civil society, academia, or the technical community will be able to solve the problem of, of the internet. And so the ver my very first submission, Martin, is that we encrust, we accept, we engage in, uh, we espouse the multi-stakeholder engagement in policy. Uh, that, that is the first thing. The second thing I would like to, I would like to bring back, to, which is not different from the first, is to keep the original vision of the internet. My, my, I, I normally say my name is Nena, I come from the internet, but actually I'm the chief web advocate at the World Wide Web Foundation, which is that organization started by Tim, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, the inventor of the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web will be 33 years very soon. The internet is over 50 years, but the, the founding vision of our fathers remained the same, that the internet would be for everyone, and that the internet would be for good. So if we keep that original vision, if we keep coming back to it, whether we are member states of the UN, whether we're private sector, whether we're civil society, that would help us a lot. So that, that question should be our guiding question when we engage in policy practices. Is this for everyone? Is this beneficial? I will close in speaking about the digital compact that we are looking forward to beginning next year. The digital compact has um, captured few, um, few priorities, if I may call that, to improve digital cooperation. It talks about connectivity, connecting all people to the internet. 
It talks about avoiding internet fragmentation. It talks about protecting data. It talks about applying human rights online. It talks about introducing accountability and criteria for discrimination and misleading content. It talks about promoting regulation of new technologies, and in this case, artificial intelligence. And it talks about digital commons as a global public good. So this is the details, if you want to find out about that vision of the internet being for everyone and being for good. So how comes down to making sure that you don't want to solve all the problems by yourself, because that drive, as you can see in the past few months uh, of the US on one block, the EU on another block, China on another block, uh, Russia on another block, the UN on its own, and civil society people trying to, to pressure everyone of what we call big tech, it's not going to lead us anywhere. So the earlier we begin to collaborate, the earlier we begin to cooperate, the better for us. So Martin, my simple answer is, let's keep the multi-stakeholder principle, let's keep the vision, and let's be sure that we are working together towards a free, open, interoperable internet that will be for everyone and will be for good. I'll stop so far. Thank you so much, Nana. And it's always, you know, a very motivating experience to hear you talk so optimistically about what surrounds us and the benefits it could bring if we just would get our act together, which hopefully we manage in a multi-stakeholder fashion that figures out the how and actually generates tangible outcomes in this regard. And uh, this, I think, is a good segue because now I'd like to move on to Latin America. Uh, Fernando, it was a great pleasure to work with you uh, personally and ECLAC on the Internet and Jurisdiction Regional Status Report that we released last year uh, jointly, um, which uh, also coincided with a global pandemic uh, where some of the information that we've been covering suddenly became extremely topical. And um, uh, we also sought to map policy approaches needed across the region to leverage the digital economy and work towards a coherent digital single market in Latin America. Could you share with us um, in your five minutes uh, maybe some of the key findings from the report that particularly around, you know, for you were relevant regarding the legal, regulatory, institutional frameworks and how they can help support uh, digital growth? So, Fernando, please, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this session. It is a pleasure to be here. Well, I would like to start by, by talking a little bit about the context of the of access to digital technologies in Latin America. As we know, the, the pandemic has revealed the consequences of an unequal access to these technologies. Even though more than 60% of the region's population has an internet connection, there are marked differences in connectivity according to income levels, geographic areas, age, among other factors. In some countries, the connectivity gap between the richest and the poorest is up to 60 percentage points. And the difference between urban and rural areas can reach up to 35 percentage point. On the other hand, in addition to connectivity gaps, Latin America presents important gaps in the digitization of the productive sector in relation to other regions. Uh, this situation, even before the pandemic, uh, largely explains the growing differences in terms of productivity. However, the current context shows us that the digitization of companies is not only a question of productivity, it's a question of survival in the market. In this sense, uh, many companies were, were, were forced to digitize their, their activities to continue operating. Some of our data shows, for example, that between April 2019 and March 2020, the number of businesses web pages increased eight times in Colombia, Mexico, and four times in Chile and Brazil. Uh, However, this accelerated digitization has been concentrated mainly in sales and marketing. Furthermore, this digitization is mainly related to the use of uh, mature digital technologies as, such as broadband. In this regard, uh, some data of the region shows, shows us that about 90% of companies, uh, regardless of their size, have access to broadband. Uh, but on the other hand, if we talk about digitization of production processes and the use of advanced technologies such as big data, artificial intelligence, robotics, etc., adoption levels are, are, are still very low. And given the clear need to accelerate digitization processes, uh, ECLAC has been working in coordination with governments, academia, industry, and technical community to implement a regional digital agenda, 
prioritizing issues related to the acceleration of this digitization. Uh, in this agenda, as you mentioned, Martin, one of the pillars is the implementation of a regional digital market, which aims to strengthen the, the digital integration of Latin America and the Caribbean, taking advantages of the geographic and linguistic proximity. So in this context, we, we consider that the regional status report that ECLAC and IENJ developed and released last year constitutes a, a very solid empirical basis that will support the implementation of the aforementioned digital agenda and the development of the regional digital market. We believe that, that this contribution to the, to the policy debate will highlight some of the talent, challenges that we, we are facing and the opportunities that we can size to move closer to an integrated and harmonized regional digital market. Some findings that I would like to highlight uh, regarding the report uh, refer, for example, to the fact that most of the experts that were surveyed uh, believe that cross-border legal challenges affecting the internet constitute a barrier for small and medium-sized enterprises in the region. In this regard, they also mentioned that these companies face various challenges in their search for, for expansion, including different regulations and standards, inconsistency in tax policies, and excessive administrative burdens. Uh, on the other hand, the, the experts also highlighted that the uncoordinated action of a wide range of actors and initiatives can hamper digitization processes. In this sense, about 73% 70, of those interviewed agree or strongly agree that there is a need for coordination to address cross-border legal challenges. This and, and other findings are presented in detail in the report that is available online uh, if you're interested in learning more about the results. Uh, I, I think I'm time. And finally, I, I'd just like to thank INJ for the work carried out and express our intention to continue collaborating with, with, with them in deepening the analysis on these issues. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, Fernando. And thank you also very much for, for pointing out the context, which also for us, was a very illuminating experience in particular once one looks behind the, the reasoning behind some of the of the regulatory and institutional frameworks that are there and uh, one thing that stuck in our minds when we were developing the report was for example with the major normative um, differences in regards to the perception of the right to be forgotten or the right to be remembered for example and the, um, the implications where you know um, there are now uh, big frameworks out there, particular by, by norm setters like the European Union, for example, or others, and uh, that a copy-paste approach uh, very much um, also does not take into account some of these considerable normative differences or even historical uh, contexts that differ uh, when understanding in regards to privacy, memory, etc., are completely different. So that was extremely insightful, and uh, we're looking forward to an ongoing cooperation with UN SEPA to, to keep investigating also these nuances which are often falling by the wayside. So um, with this, I would now like to uh, move to Mr. Didier Nurukim Fura, who is uh, Director of Technology and Innovation at Smart Africa. Uh, Didier, thank you again so much for also uh, joining us today, as you've done also in, in, in previous sessions. Um, your experience at Smart Africa um, is also bringing a very valuable perspective do these sorts of legal regulatory frameworks um, that Fernando was also outlining resonate with you as well from an African point of view? How can policymakers make use or benefit from, you know, some of these maybe best practices and also the potentials um, that digital transformation uh, would bring with it uh, if it is in a sustainable um, approach? So Didier would be very interested to hear a little bit more uh, from you. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you for uh, for the opportunity to share uh, perspectives uh, from from Africa and also the opportunity to be part of this uh, uh, this uh, important discussion. So I'd like to, to thank the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network and the UN, uh, as well as the Economic Commission for Latin American Caribbean for organizing and inviting also Smart Africa to be part of this discussion on leveraging sustainable uh, digital transformation. Uh, so on the question uh, that we have, how we can promote 
the free, secure, and open internet to enable digital participation and make use of effective uh, uh, within the context shared by my predecessors uh, uh, also apply also to us. And I want to respond to, to this question really in two angles. Uh, the first part of the question, and also the second part, just to make it a bit easier to, uh, to share our contribution here. So on the first point, uh, it has to do with access and affordability of broadband and internet. Uh, it's still a very important conversation for the continent. Uh, in Africa, various industry reports put Africa at an average of uh, 40 plus internet penetration rate as of end of 2020. And, um, and um, the state, the GSMA uh, state of the mobile internet connectivity put the usage gap at 49% and the coverage gap at 25%. So it's obvious that as we have all this conversation uh, about internet governance to put in context also how Africa currently is standing, uh, and some of the economic and business um, uh, modules, which are private sector led, are not able to address the current challenges that we have in terms of internet usage gap and coverage gap in particular, and largely because some of these areas that are currently not connected are considered not to be economically attractive to the private sector uh, stakeholders. And to this end, we must work together to adopt innovative financing, investing and business modules models uh, which will uh, facilitate, uh, among other things, the increase of the footprint of connectivity of data center, the cloud interconnecting African countries, aggregating the capacity, the internet, so that we can really leverage the economy of scale. We're talking about a 1.3 billion population in Africa, encourage infrastructure sharing among service providers, make smart devices accessible and affordable to citizens, develop relevant content to our citizens, especially localizing with language, because Africa is a bit particular. We have, uh, yes, we have English, French, uh, Arabic, and so on, but when you really go to the citizen, you realize that we have so many dialects, so many local languages, uh, and if you want them to, to have, want the, our citizens to use the internet, the, the localization and especially language is very important, provide digital literacy, digital skills, uh, capacity building, and implement also, of course, uh, policies that really that we, that stimulate the use of, of a secure, uh, open, but also secure uh, internet, so that people can safely interact, safely uh, engage in the digital uh, in the digital world. For the second part of the question, which really talked about regulatory and institution framework, I'd like to add a couple of points here. First of all, in the context of Smart Africa, we're working to create a single digital market uh, by 2030. And we're not simply an international organization made of national government. Our alliance was funded because uh, they, they, in a belief that a multi-stakeholder approach is fundamental requirement if we really want to leverage ICT to accelerate social economic development of the continent. We're convinced that this cannot be done by government alone. And the approach of having the government doing alone is, 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 has proven not to be successful. So it's important that all is a stakeholder, multi stakeholder dialogue that involves private sector, academia, civil society, regulators, and also the beneficiary were the citizens. So alliance, our alliance uh, is currently 32 African member states, but also a variety of, uh, of organizations that work in the same in the same direction. And we, we wish by bringing all of them to create synergies instead of silos and to allow uh, people to uh, uh, really to, to, to get the, to leverage the maximum out of this dialogue. Uh, we believe that this will also allow the African uh, stakeholders to come together with one voice and to tackle all the issues which are related to inter uh, internet governance. And the last point I'd like to, to mention here is that um, uh, what we're doing, we're not a silo, we're not alone. We need, we need to learn also from what other continents are doing uh, in terms of policy and regulations. Uh, and um, for example, uh, one of the perspectives we have is that there, is 30, there are 32 countries and each country has its own way of doing. What about bringing the best and, and coming together uh, beyond the traditional borders uh, that, uh, that exist? Uh, we have one large market, 1.3 billion people. What about looking at opportunities to harmonize regulation, harmonize laws, uh, create a conducive environment that 
really attract the development of the internet. So I will probably pause uh, by that, but I just wanted to say that uh, there is an opportunity and it's important that this dialogue uh, continue to be multi-stakeholders to make sure that we derive the most uh, of, out, of, uh, out of our collaboration. Thank you very much, Didier. And also to, to pick a few things. So, um, yes, I mean, based on the, the analysis um, uh, ahead of the, the project that we are now embarking on uh, in Africa and the experiences from other regional um, kind of uh, investigations, the terminology topic is so key for the inclusivity question and for the digital literacy aspect. And um, even us here uh, using English, uh, and for me, it's not my first language, you know, using it to this extent and using certain terms, which might include data governance, what is data sovereignty, etc., which we'll talk about also in the second session. Already this has so much um, value judgment baked in there that when we go back to the question of how can we actually formulate these regulations so that they ex exactly achieve this sustainable digital transformation that we are envisioning, um, that exactly these core questions on what are words, what do they mean, um, certainly are something that um, that is of utmost um, necessity and um, uh, that, that's appreciated as point that you made. Um, now I'd like to actually open the floor uh, to those who are joining us either at the workshop room uh, in Katowice or here um, in the in the Zoom call. Um, feel free to either you know uh, ask your questions in the chat or uh, to raise your hand and then with the help of our IGF um uh, tech team will then uh, enable you um, to share a few questions um so yeah don't hold back uh while we're waiting maybe for somebody to uh, to step forward one thing that i would be interested to maybe ask to to all three of you nena and uh, fernando and uh, didier um, is also the question of um, the interfaces between the let's say, national or regional uh, policy uh, ecosystem to what we can perceive as almost global gravitational policy forces um, that are taking place, um, that are not always built with interfaces in mind, uh, but rather going in and kind of uh, being docked on top. I would be very much interested in, in your thoughts and your perspectives on, on exactly those interfaces. Uh, to the global, is there enough amplification of your perspectives, you think, from the regional point of view? Um, you know, um, that would be very interesting, I think, as a as a conversation starter. Um, so any any takers? Nana, I see you're unmuted, so I'm just jumping at you. I right. did, I did. Uh, once again, um, I could have been in the room, uh, but I'll be there tomorrow morning. You can catch me and we can talk more. Uh, one thing, one thing, Martin, Overall, it is at the national level that the rubber hits the road. So I'm happy. I think in the very first day, uh, I had made that point that it is great for us to have multilateralism. It is great for us to have global uh, policy um, convenings. It is great to have global IGF, but ultimately, it is at the national level that these policies matter the most. It is at national level that citizens like myself can hold elected officials responsible, right? So while we might have accountability measures for global enterprises, uh, as a citizen, I, I, I am more empowered to hold the person I elected uh, into power uh, accountable because that person is accountable to me as a citizen. So I will say, first of all, where I pay my taxes is where my rights are greater. Having said that, um, we are at the IGF, and this is the UN part of it, the UN Global IGF. We have the Africa IGF, we have the West Africa IGF, and we have our national IG. So I think that the IGF is actually a wonderful uh, policy tool that allows for interface. And, and, and I'd like to put that on record. Now, I think that the UN is also an interface, um, a convener, uh, because it allows for member states uh, to come together and share ideas. I know that the UN is not as, as strong as we all want it to be, 
but at least it is the best that we have. Uh, like, like there's that restaurant in New York, not far from the UN General Headquarters itself, that says the US is a very bad institution, but we don't have anything better than it. So I think that those are interfaces that we want to look at. First, uh, at the global level, the UN, uh, the IGF as it stands today, with all its ramifications, but ultimately at the national level. And so uh, I, for myself, I would still think that uh, even as the World Wide Web Foundation, we do recognize that while we might have global policy tools, while we might have global ramifications of our advocacy and policy issues, uh, our strongest point, our most impactful work is done at national level. And that's why uh, we have something called national coalitions uh, done under the Alliance for Affordable Internet, because national coalitions are capable of adopting policies, implementing them, monitoring them, and talking about their specific uh, financing. So I, I will go for the national first and then be open. They call it global. Um, have a voice globally, but action at the national level. Thank you, Nana. So a very interesting kind of link made here with direct accountability. Uh, from a national point of view, but also the acknowledgement that, of course, global policy movements have a huge implication on uh, how impactful then actually the, the national also regulation and frameworks could look like. Fernando Didier, maybe a reaction from you two on what just Nina was just saying, and again, also underlining the question of the interface between the national regional frameworks and the movements that we currently see on a, on a real macro scale globally speaking. Any takers? Uh, thank, thank you. Um, let, let me just, um, yeah, I think I, I'll go to, to the same uh, direction to my sister Nena on, on the approach. I think it's important that it's properly rooted at national levels uh, because uh, when we look at the, the uh, let me call it the constituency, the people really behind the one who are using uh, the internet today, the communities first. It first, they are first grounded somewhere. Although um, uh, we are more, I say, globalized world, but at the end, we talk about consumer. We talk about people who are using who are really first of all at the national level. And I think strong uh, national uh, uh, in first the, the, at the at the level of the, the, the national level. If it's strong, it's actually strengthen the entire ecosystem. Uh, I think I just wanted to sort of uh, emphasize there, but also we, with the nature of the internet, we we, we actually glo globalized words today, whether uh, the experience that you have at the national level, it's probably also shared, the shared experience with something which is happening also in the continent, the regional, continental or the global, uh, although, although sometimes the reality from a country to another is different, but I think leveraging also the strength of regional and continental and global, uh, will definitely have a strong, strong value. We, we tend as smart Africa to look at, uh, at the continent at, uh, at, at one big market. We're talking about Africa, but again, the same perspective can be applied to the entire world, seven plus eight billion people. Uh, I, I think there are a lot, of, a lot of commonalities, a lot of similarities, and it can only by, you know, by strengthening uh, this collaboration and platform like this one that we have today, allow us really to have uh, a, 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 a return of experience, a shared experience that can really only help us to build a, a, a stronger uh, ecosystem at the end of the day. So I just wanted to add on what uh, Nina said to say that uh, I think this, uh, this platform are important uh, and uh, starting strengthening from the bottom up, I think would, uh, would, would add a lot of value, although there are also a lot of top down uh, issues also that, you know, that's when you can also learn and you can also uh, build a stronger internet uh, governance. Thank you, Didier. And I saw Fernando, he also would like to react. Please feel free. Uh, Martin, uh, thank you. Just uh, to mention, well, I agree with what was, what was mentioned. But very briefly, uh, we think that national policies must be coordinated and considered in the international context, given the global nature of technologies, particularly the internet. It is precisely in the sense that we seek the implementation of the regional digital market that has a significant degree of coordination 
uh, regarding normative and regulatory harmonization. Because what we have been seeing in, in the region is that most countries are, are developing policies and actions only considering the, 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 the local context. And those policies are not as effective as uh, they could be if they are, uh, they are applied and, and they are designed considering this, this international context. I see. All right. Thank you for also adding this uh, this perspective. So the few things that I pick then in this regard is uh, certainly um, we align the need for uh, platforms that amplify then also those perspectives from a national regional level. At the same time, also uh, the realization that uh, the global kind of policy dynamics certainly do have an imprint and it's very difficult to also ensure that um, all of the diverse perspectives that are needed for local and national uh, frameworks to actually do, do just by uh, you know the citizens and the accountability kind of standards um, that they do uh, that they do so that's that's interesting um, so we have another five minutes uh, in this session so um, again maybe a question into the room if there is anybody would like to um, also raise the virtual hand. I see somebody in the room physically. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm Sonia George. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Affordable Internet. I actually know all of you, but you, the moderator, uh, which is funny. Anyway, um, the reason why I wanted to ask these questions, because I wanted to specifically ask Didier and uh, Fernando, if they could share an example from their partner countries that they work with, where they felt that a country was able to not only have policy and regulatory frameworks that were on one hand, a reflection of regional uh, ambition and regional guidance, but at the same time, um, contextualized sufficiently at the national level that actually made it successful. Because I think the tension between the kind of regional approach versus the national approach or the combination is, is really striking that, that, that balance where you can have really strong national policy that at the same time, is a model in the subregions is a reflection of regional guidance, but it is actually implementable, actionable, and it's successful. I think a lot of times those of us who work in policy have experienced cases where on paper, it might have appeared really interesting and to a certain extent somewhat a success, but then in practice it failed. And so I wanna challenge you to think about that uh, challenge and, and especially considering some situations that I'm sure you've had where things did not go as well as you thought. And for those that did, what made them different? What were the conditions? What were the issues that made them be successful national implementations that were also proud moments to the regional for a regional approach? I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any takers for the question? Fernando, PTM. Uh, thank you. That's that's um, that's a very interesting question, um, uh, and um, I, I think uh, what I've, what I'll say really from a from a perspective from Smart Africa, uh, there are uh, platforms that allow exchange of experience. We have, uh, for example, uh, uh, a council of African regulators that bring uh, regulators. Uh, uh, telecom regulators that make a lot of decision around the internet. We have a platform that bring uh, ministers of ICT from uh, different countries. It's called the Council of, Af Af uh, of uh, ICT Ministers from Smart Africa. Important to note that Smart Africa is 32 countries for the moment. Uh, it's not the, all the 50 plus countries, but there's also a lot of re sharing of experience in terms of promoting an open, an open uh, uh, free internet and secure internet. So such platform allow really exchanges. And uh, sometimes when there's also national uh, internet governance forum, there's also a, a lot of insights which are coming from the regions. Uh, they bring people uh, from government, private sector, and all the, you know, the, the broader stakeholders to come and to, to share some experience. But at the end of the day, we realize also that countries have their own national context, uh, which, uh, I'll say sort of influence uh, the policy and regulation, which, which are a framework which are mm -hmm. at the end passed. And sometimes tensions are not only 
between national and regional, but sometimes also tensions are also at the national level because perspective from governments tend to be different from perspective from the private sector or civil society. And uh, these are uh, because of the interests. Government will probably be more interested in security, for example, while you have maybe uh, others will be more interested in open, free internet. And uh, so it bring different dynamics on a country, uh, you know, a country from a country to country perspective. And, uh, and, and I like the comment from Nena here, even within government, you're right. Uh, even within government, uh, you have a different perspective. Some will have be maybe promoting more an open approach. Other will be more, uh, I close everything by default is closed and are open only on a need basis. Mm -hmm. So this tension at the national level happen. In the regional level, it tends really to learn from others to see how to can, that uh, they can be reflective of the national. Uh, but I, I think we all tend to, 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 to gain together by working together. Uh, and it's only by opening and learning from what is being done in another country or in regional that it actually open perspectives. And that's what we're promoting in Smart Africa this type of collaboration, this type of exchanges. Uh, so that's what I'll, I'll, I'd like to say, but indeed some frictions happen, both national, but also national versus regulation. Uh, I mean, national versus, versus regional or continental uh, because the interests uh, or the positioning or the what is at stake is actually different from a country to another. Thank you, Didier. Fernando, would you also like to swiftly react, please? Yes, Martin, thank you. Uh, Sonia, thank you for the question. It's good to see you. Uh, well, I, I, will, I will just mention a, an example. Uh, we have been working with the countries of the Pacific Alliance on the development of a, of a very specific strategy on the implementation of a regional digital market strategy for, for the group, for the, these uh, four countries. And what has worked for the success of this process? I think it's the political commitment because this strategy was approved at the presidential level and is currently working on, on concrete action. So I, I think one of the, the, the main factors, uh, particularly in, in Latin America, is to have this, uh, this involvement of the, of the authorities and the, and the um, commitment to, 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 to this issue. Uh, we, we work with different countries, but we see different realities. So I, I, I I like to, to mention this example precisely because that that characteristic. Thank you, Fernando, uh, and thank you all for um, you know the very engaged discussion now in this first half of our session. Um, I think now is the moment then that we have a look at basically the other side of the coin or um, the other dimension. I think that's always underlying when we talk about digital topics and digital transformation, uh, which is why also. Uh, we wanted to really have a dialogue on the topic of data and data governance in particular uh, in, the, in, the, in the remaining time um, that we have together. Um, and really to understand also through our uh, uh, speakers um, what role they believe data governance and digital, for example, ID frameworks play in uh, leveraging sustainable digital transformation. And uh, uh, for this, I'm extremely thrilled and very thankful to also welcome our first speaker for this session, uh, who's joining us from the African Union Commission, uh, Mr. Christian S. Minungu, who is head of division for the Information Society at the Infrastructure and Energy Department um, there at the African Union Commission. So Mr. Minungu, um, I'm uh, hoping that the connection is uh, well today. Um, uh, as we have recently launched a project uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development on cross-border digital policies for Africa, um, we would be very interested in your perspective um, that, role, uh, that the role of data governance and uh, digital ID frameworks could play to leverage what should be one of the outcomes of um, all of these policies and all of these governance mechanisms, which is a sustainable digital transformation um, that unlocks benefits for all. So would be very interested to hear from you and uh, please, uh, you have the, the virtual floor. And we have to just double check if the IGF Secretariat colleagues have unmuted you. So we have to make sure. Yes, there you are. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Martin, for uh, giving me the floor. Thank you, uh, 
uh, to everyone. I want to particularly uh, express um, gratitude to Internet and uh, Jurisdiction Policy Networks and uh, GIZ for giving uh, this opportunity to African Union Commission to be part of this uh, important panel. Yes, um, um, you, we all know in 2020, February 2020, the EU leadership uh, adopted the digital transformation uh, strategy for Africa for the period uh, 2020 to 2030 period. Uh, this uh, strategy builds on uh, funda uh, foundational pillars. Uh, also, the strategy defines some critical sectors like uh, agriculture, health, education, to name few, but also the strategy identify key uh, cross-cutting theme to be considered if we want to uh, adequately lead the process of uh, the digital transformation uh, strategy. Trans, uh, digital transformation of the uh, in of the continent. In this regard, uh, digital uh, ID and uh, data policy have been uh, identified as two of the major one. And since the adoption of uh, the strategy, we have been uh, uh, working to make to develop uh, two framework on uh, the two issues, the data policy framework uh, to set common vision, priorities, strategic uh, principle, and uh, uh, come up with key recommendations can, which can guide African member states in developing their national uh, sis data system and capability effectively to effectively uh, to <clears throat> effectively derive value from data, because we all know uh, with uh, mobile, uh, uh, with the digital technology, uh, we have to, as, as we speak, a, a very important of amount of uh, data that can be used to to, to can be used for uh, the African uh, economies and society development. Uh, of course, data is linked to digital ID. We also develop uh, a framework on uh, digital uh, uh, ID, uh, namely uh, interoperability framework for uh, digital ID. This, those two frameworks were developed on, uh, in an uh, inclusive manner uh, because uh, as uh, previous speakers in the previous session has rightly said, uh, we need to go together. No one can succeed. And uh, the African Union as political organization uh, of which the mandate is to develop policies, strategies, and coordinate action on the continent. Our main responsibility is to bring everyone together uh, on, uh, to achieve what we, we, we intend to do. So those uh, uh, two framework was, uh, were developed by a task force, which include uh, the, uh, the, the, economic, the regional economic communities which are the building block for uh, AU projects, UNICA, uh, Smart Africa. I'm happy my brother Didier is uh, in this uh, uh, panel. They, 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 they made very uh, significant contribution in this work and uh, also uh, some uh, specific uh, 
organization at uh, the continent level and as well as uh, international organization. We are in the process of uh, uh, and take, uh, incorporating, incorporating uh, in feedback we receive from uh, member state uh, in order to improve uh, the two framework and submit them in uh, the in the uh, to the uh, policy organ uh, adoption. Of course, data governance is very important because this is uh, the foundation for trust. Uh, without uh, appropriate governance, we cannot ensure uh, <clears throat> data are adequately collected and mostly uh, trusted and used in the manner we want, want it to be in order to contribute to the social economic development of our member state. I want to stop here and give uh, opportunity to others to reflect on the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Minungu. And um, yes, I mean, you're really pointing out um, how advanced in certain stages already the thinking is in the region in regards to data governance, digital ID questions, and uh, how necessary it seems to be that there is this connective tissue that makes sure that not only uh, regionally um, all of this knowledge is you know, uh, connected uh, and shared, but that also we ensure through you know, platforms like today at the IGF or in potentially the project um, that we've been referring to, to amplify this also to the awareness of uh, global policymakers and those who also have to take these developments into consideration when they develop their interfaces in collaboration um, with the African continent. So thank you so much for that. Um, I would now like to move forward to uh, Mrs. Fernanda Garza, uh, who, as I mentioned before, is the first vice chair of the International Chamber of Commerce. And as we just heard, um, data governance is an important concern for many and how we reap uh, the benefits and harness the challenges that surround data policy making um, are certainly of highest relevance. So, um, there are, of course, many examples of how um, data can be used to help us address key challenges, such as climate change uh, comes to mind, health uh, in the current circumstances, education and all of the SDGs. But could you provide us some concrete examples from your perspective, Mrs. Garza, uh, and explain the role that uh, you believe uh, data governance plays in leveraging uh, the sustainable digital transformation? So please, um, you have Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you to all my colleagues. Uh, throughout these days, we have been hearing how our societies generate unimaginable scale data, estimated at a mind-blowing 175 zettabytes for 2025. Just a modern car alone generates 25 gigabytes of data per hour. And this data is the source of future wealth. It feeds artificial intelligence, algorithms, and future innovations. It will transform the way we produce, we consume, and live. And data is also extremely coveted. And in a global digital landscape that is rapidly changing, extremely competitive, and threatened by fragmentation, common agreed frameworks on how data is shared, secure, and regulated are indispensable for the future of digitalization, the future of our economies and our societies. And this is an issue on which the International Chamber of Commerce has been actively working for many years. We need more than ever to create economic opportunities to recover from the devastating effects of COVID-19, but we have to do this in ways which prepare us for the future. We need data-driven innovation to reinvigorate the economy and also to tackle many of the challenges facing the world today in areas such as public health, the environment, as you mentioned, and food security. Organizations of all sizes rely on cross-border data flows to conduct their day-to-day -day businesses. And data flows enable small and medium-sized enterprises, which are the engines of growth in most countries to extend their market reach 
access latest innovations and collaborate with other organizations to minimize economic and technical uncertainties. And this brings me to the importance of international trade. The international trading system has suffered greatly from the pandemic and needs support. Even before the pandemic, there was a need to revitalize and modernize the global trading system to prepare it for the future, which is very much a digital future where data will play an essential role. Data flows now account for a larger share of the impact of global, global flows than international trading routes. Cross-border flows of data play a crucial role in supporting both internal and cross-border trade, and it is essential for the efficient functioning of international trade to allow these flows to continue and not to stifle them. Although the importance of data to economies around the world today is evident, businesses working with data across borders are confronted with significant challenges. The private sector has consistently advocated for globally interoperable policy frameworks that would reduce barriers to the free flow of data across national borders based on trust, ensuring that important policy objectives such as privacy and data protection continue to be addressed. And such flows are the heart of the global economy and form the backbone of social empowerment and inclusive economic growth, along with innovation that is so often the enabler of sustainable development. However, there is an increasing lack of trust due to concerns that important policy objectives such as privacy, security, consumer and human rights protections, access to data, or even industrial competitiveness cannot be adequately achieved when data moves abroad. Failing to adequately address these objectives can result in increasingly fragmented national approaches to data governance and a growing number of restrictions that prohibit or significantly encumber cross-border data flows. Therefore, it is essential to secure adequate safeguards for the protection of personal and non-personal data and strive for consistency and interoperability across jurisdictions to ensure the trust of citizens and business, no matter where their data are stored or processed. Businesses are committed to the protection of personal data, including when it is transferred across borders. And cooperation between governments and stakeholders, including business and multilateral organizations, are needed to advocate for interoperable policy frameworks that would facilitate cross-border data flows, enabling data to be exchanged and used in a trusted manner, thereby aiming for high privacy standards. Establishing trust and minimizing disruptions in data flows are fundamental to reaping the, benefit, the benefits of digitalization. Business stands ready to provide relevant input and evidence to assist with the evaluation of existing practices and timely development of policy guidance that can safeguard trust in the data-driven economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Garza. And also to quickly uh, pick on a few items, I mean, the need to counter the lack of trust. I think that's an underlying theme that at least I've come across in many of the sessions at the IGF. And that's a new development, really, this feeling that um, it's less and less trustworthy, even within the entire governance family. Um, you know, we always were aware of the challenges, but that's, that's a threat. And thank you also for reintroducing again the the distinction between also personal and non-personal data, which is a nuance that often enough is not considered uh, when talking about data governance and the particularities also of you know unlocking value to it. Um, but uh, that's that's certainly something we can discuss 
probably the Q&A in a second. So without further ado, to make the best of the time um, that we have at our disposal, I would now also uh, go back to our co-organizers of the session uh, from the uh, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. In this case, I would like to hand the microphone to Georgina Nunes uh, Reyes, who's the Economic Affairs Officer. And um, Georgina, I would be very interested to hear from the UN ECLAC side if these examples that were just given uh, by uh, by Christian and by uh, by Fer, Fer, Maria Fernanda, um, to, to if they resonate with you, and if you have any further examples of the role of uh, data in development and how a fertile policy environment could uh, support success, and uh, if there are any tensions and considerations around data that uh, UN Act like has come across uh, when formulating their their policies on this. So please, uh, Georgina. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to be here sharing with some thoughts on, on the role of data governance. And I would like to, to, to uh, concentrate my comments on some findings of the Internet and Jurisdiction report related to data flows in the role of governance. And while the free flow of data is advocated as a fundamental uh, uh, driver of uh, digital transformation, uh, innovation, economic growth, and social benefits, some concerns have been raised about, uh, about cross-border data uh, flows, data protection, privacy, cybersecurity, and antitrust practices. That all my, uh, Mrs. Garza and Mr. Uh, Meningen. Uh, mentioned before, and uh, um, and and these concerns have prompted initiatives and analysis regarding data sovereignty issues that are extensively covered in the Internet and Jurisdiction Report. Um, the free flow of data strongly resonate across Latin America and the Caribbean region among policymakers, as you uh, uh, as you mentioned, um, uh, Martin, business and even citizens, and these concepts raise several. Uh, several questions due to the complexity of data treatment and multilateral initiatives that imply on actions take by, uh, taken by governments on cross-border data flows uh, must take into consideration different uh, jurisdictions, as you also mentioned. The cross-border data flows depend largely upon trust, as Ms. Uh, Garza and uh, Mr. Menon meaningful uh, mentioned before. Uh, therefore, dealing with potential misuses or of, of data while preserving its free transit requires dedicated uh, trust building frameworks. Uh, data protection must be understood as a main factor in cross-border data flows establishment. And uh, there is a resulting need for an effort to harmonize different standards and regulations um, that may have impact across multiple areas. Uh, diverging uh, regulations make it more difficult for companies to scale up and operate in different marketplaces, taking advantage of all um, that the digital economy has to offer in terms of growth opportunities. Uh, in this sense, it is important to ask ourselves what, econo uh, what economic and social benefit could be um, obtained by harmonizing the legal frameworks on data protection and, and, and promoting the, the free flow of data. Um, and it is essential to, to improve the understanding of what it is at stake. Trends in technology and the resulting investment by companies require a legal framework that allows them to exchange data in key areas of regional economic development, such as biotechnology, um, robotics, and, and Internet of Things, etc. Data flow is also critical to the development of digital enabled business models, as I've already mentioned here, such as digital platforms. Uh, a free flow of data is an essential condition in the business and, and models of company, despite the benefits of harmonizing um, uh, regulations. The Latin America is far away about, uh, about examples. Uh, I, I, I should say that Latin America is far away from harmonizing at uh, 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 global level. And um, uh, the regulatory minimum proposed by the report, for instance, uh, may be an interesting solution to achieve a, a, a better data, data flow environment within the region. There are countries in the region whose legal frameworks have been recognized by the European Union after adopting one of the three most uh, used regulatory uh, harmonization strategies found in the literature, similar normative creation, adequacy, and regulatory minimum. 
Uh, therefore, the, the internet and jurisdiction contributes by both providing com a comprehensive overviews of issues and multi-stakeholders uh, viewpoints and a holistic approach to face these uh, current concerns and perspectives thus renewing the debate and uh, introducing new elements to the discussion. Uh, for instance, the characterization of data, the description of their multidimensionality, the introduction of the complex relationship between actors and value chains that are related to exponential growth and diverse diversification of data. Well, in summary, there are um, three points which I would like to highlight. First, the cross-border data flows and its consequences for data governance, which involves enhance, enhancement of legal and institutional framework. These uh, elements are key. If we want to talk about the, 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 the situation of the our region. Second, the increasing necessity to recognize the value of data as a key intangible asset highly valued by the market, that it's another Point that it's very important, especially when we have some initiative to create uh, some uh, data markets. And, uh, and, this, and, 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 and in terms of competition and data interoperability, the creation of data marketplaces that have the potential of leveling the playing field for small players, such as startups or small enterprises, is the third element that I want to point out. And finally, governments should address these topics not only with adequate regulatory framework, but also by exploring and fostering innovative approaches, technical tools, legal frameworks, and, 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 and concepts that allow us to resign, re, redesign a new digital governance scheme. Those are the elements that I think that we can identify in the regional framework in terms of data protection or, or in data governance, I'm sorry, data governance. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, Georgina, and greatly appreciate the points that you brought also in uh, to again underline the notion of, of course, the cross-border nature of the data flows and the challenges that come with them. Um, of course, the realization also from a regulatory point of view, how valuable and what an enabling asset data actually is. Uh, so this is something that I think uh, resonates with a lot of us and also the notion that you introduced of data markets that uh, ideally could enable a level playing field also for smaller players or for those that as of today in 2021 are not yet sitting at all of the uh, tables where these global policy dialogues and also data governance or even you know the de facto governance in form of you know business might our revenue are being taken place. So thank you very much for, for bringing this nuance into the discussion. And uh, as we did this in the first part of the session, I would be very interested to spend the remaining 20 minutes um, in also opening for uh, questions from the floor in Katowice in Poland or here um, through the chat or through a raising hand um, in the Zoom call um, in case you have anything that you would like to share when it comes to the data and data governance uh, dynamic um, that certainly plays a big role uh, in our pathway to a sustainable uh, digital transformation. So um, giving everybody just a few moments to, to think, to ponder, is there anything that resonated? Is there anything um, that we have not touched upon yet? Um, so I'll let you do so. Um, and to, to kick it off maybe in parallel, um, for uh, Maria Fernanda, for Georgina, or for uh, for Christian, I would also be very interested in uh, whether or not you also already experienced um, in, in real terms this tension between the free flow of data concept, uh, but also uh, the notion of data localization measures and uh, this first reaction, uh, so to speak, uh, to this new asset to actually pull it closer to oneself than rather letting it flow. And that might also be a question where our remaining speakers maybe could react to in case um, you have had experiences or um, you have any additional comments to this particular tension that we've also started to identify as one of the key, key challenges uh, to actually formulate a suitable regulatory framework. So um, maybe a quick question of that kind to our speakers, anybody, interested talking and reacting to data sovereignty versus data free flows. Ah, and we have somebody else from the floor and I'm directly gonna jump at Mr. 
Uh, Yamanaka, thank you so much for raising your hand. Uh, IGF colleagues, could you help us unmute Mr. Yamanaka to ask his question? Yeah, I think now you should be able to raise your voice. Thank you so much. Um, the host is still, um, okay, host is unmuted for me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Atsushi Yamanaka. I'm a professor at the Kobe Institute of Computing Graduate Schools, as well as a JICA expert. Uh, is in, uh, in the area of ICT for development. Um, I was actually in another panel, actually, uh, where we talked about platform economy and SMEs um, challenges and opportunities. And there as well, we actually talked about data governance uh, issues. Um, you know, we, you know, we over there, we're talking about a lot of actually data, even though there is actually questions of data governance in terms of like sovereignties and safeguarding and so on. The fact is that already a lot of data is flowing transnationally. So, um, you know, we I understand that, uh, you know, the panelists here were talking about the importance of actually data governance or having some kind of framework. But the reality is actually proceeding much faster than like what we are actually trying to, you know, have a sort of um, a benchmark. So, I just wanted to question my colleagues here, you know. How could we actually mitigate? Because the reality is moving much, much faster than the regulation is catching up. Um, this is obviously in many other fields as well, whether it's fintech, blah, blah, blah. But still, this data sovereignties and data transactions, we really need to have actually have a benchmark such as like GDPR so that a lot of other countries could follow uh, and just you know, have sort of this regular. Um, Sort of a set of standard where a lot of countries could actually formulate their own data policies and data strategies out of it. So I, I just wanted to get the reaction from the, the panelists about uh, that kind of thought. And then how fast should we move forward? Because that is really critical. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this question. Um, so I'm throwing this then directly at our uh, speakers. And Maria Fernanda, I see you unmuted. Would you have a first reaction to the reactiveness or the proactiveness, I would assume? Uh, <laughs> yes, we really need to move fast. And, and it is incumbent uh, upon companies to directly and comprehensively implement their legal obligations to protect privacy and security of data across the entire processing life cycle or locations of processing. And governments should also assure that their policy and regulatory environments are up to date and reflect best practice regarding high levels of privacy and security protections. Because lack of you know, interoperability across the policy and regulatory environments can create needless administrative burdens and compliance inconsistency across jurisdictions. And furthermore, as privacy is both subjective to the data subject and tied to the cultural and legal context of the jurisdiction, harmonization can be difficult to achieve. And this is why there is a clear and urgent need to enhance cooperation on data governance, data protection, and identifying opportunities to overcome differences, explore commonalities in regulatory approaches, and promote interoperability. And this does not intend to diminish any jurisdiction's protection or to aim to, for the lowest common denominator of privacy standards, but rather to find ways of avoiding duplicative compliance requirements and needless administrative burdens while assuring adequate levels of protections. Trust is strengthened when governments instead adopt robust and comprehensive commitments to protect the rights and freedoms of individuals, including the fundamental right to privacy, when personal data are subject to government access. And trust is further strengthened when governments work together directly to reduce barriers to cross-border data flows. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Fernanda. Anybody else from our group that would like to react uh, to Mr. Yamanaka? Because if this is not the case, then maybe also a quick reaction, because uh, I mean, as uh, Maria Fernanda was also referring to unintended consequences of some of the regulations that are coming in. Um, and uh, the actual example that you gave, uh, uh, sir, um, of uh, another session where, you know, another angle of data governance was discussed. 
it all comes uh, back to the question of silos, um, at least based on our on our current uh, observations. So, for example, in the international trade policy circles, the discussion about data governance is at a extremely uh, advanced stage already because it's exa exactly driven by the reality of some of these market forces actually depending on the value generation uh, through these data flows. But at the same time, there is, of course, also a gigantic discussion going on and has been for decades in the whole um, open data uh, um, um, kind of movement and community, which also has a certain uh, degree of, uh, you know, very particular knowledge and perspectives. And um, it is pretty striking um, also to observe that um, in between those silos, again, we go back to the very beginning of the session, uh, the question of terminology comes into play, the question of what the words mean, and not to forget, because uh, that's always the risk in our policy circles when we conceptualize these things and talk so broadly about them in those short hours we have in these sessions, it's also the question of the schools of thought that the policymakers or the practitioners come from. Um, you know, uh, do they have an engineering background? Have they worked uh, with legal uh, topics before they joined into the regulatory frameworks and are more familiar with drafting and text? Or is it is another behavior? So just sharing a little bit um, kind of the, the ongoing observations um, that we had so far. And uh, one item that I wanted to also, in this regard, also underline, um, because the, the colleagues from UN ECLAC uh, or at least Georgina had to leave a bit earlier for another session, is that um, this brings us to this other big question that I would ask into the group, uh, the question of inclusivity, really, of uh, hearing these perspectives from other regions than from the global north, uh, where still most of the, uh, of the business players are sitting, many of the organizations and governments that are dictating to a certain extent from a global macro scale, some of these regulatory frameworks, so um, maybe here a question into the room in Katowice uh, from your experiences in the, in the other sessions you went to, but also here in our Zoom um, kind of uh, virtual environment. What could we do in addition um, uh, to ensure a better awareness and amplification of these perspectives that will share with us today uh, through our speakers so that they also make their way into the awareness of these global fora? because there's a proliferation of initiatives. We are all thinly spread. It's becoming more and more difficult to convey these challenges, um, as anybody here can adhere to who goes to these sessions. So um, what are kind of key, uh, key best practices, key experiences? How can we, how can we emphasize this more um, to make sure that these voices are heard? So long monologue with, with one question. Um, anybody in the room in Katowice, Anybody here that would be interested to share a little bit their observations or maybe best practices they have seen so far? Thank you, Nena. I also see uh, you've written something in the chat. So I just read it out. Huh? Uh, one case in point is the management of personal data uh, during the pandemic. As of today, I've given digital and biological data for PCR tests in every country I've traveled to, in addition to the country I live in, and I actually have three COVID-19 related apps. Yes, uh, certainly can, uh, can relate to that. Um, even for us here in Europe at this point in time, uh, huge clashes between different approaches. The French uh, centralized everything on one server, and there were enormous discussions in German-speaking countries of how to decentralize the data collection so that there is no uh, approach to actually um, tackle it. Yeah. Um, I also see your hand, uh, uh, Mr. Minuto, so please uh, uh, feel free to, to, to react to, to our discussion. Well, thank you. To... Yes. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I missed some, uh, some part of the discussion. On uh, inclusivity, I... I want to recall that Africa is uh, somehow uh, a continent of paradox. I, <clears throat> it is the most youthful continent, a youthful continent. Unfortunately, as uh, one of the speaker recall in uh, previous uh, discussion, we have 
the lowest rate of uh, internet penetration, uh, which means uh, the access African population has have less access to internet, the connectivity is low. Therefore, one of the targets for the African Union is how to ensure inclusivity for uh, everyone. And we start with uh, uh, development of uh, increasing enhancement of uh, uh, access for everyone. Uh, it is a multidimensional, uh, we need here the multi various action to be taken to ensure this inclusivity because uh, it is not only a matter of uh, uh, access to internet, but we need also to develop some, uh, uh, for some uh, category of uh, population, uh, to uh, fight against it, uh, illiteracy, to enable people to know what we are uh, talking about, what is internet, what are the, the, the strengths and uh, weakness. We are trying to also uh, ensure better cyberspace in this regard. We, we have been uh, reviewing the EU Malabo Convention on Cybersecurity uh, and uh, Personal Data Protection. We'll also uh, develop uh, cybersecurity strategy, all to ensure that uh, everyone is uh, on board and no one is uh, left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Inungo. Um, that is certainly uh, also a very, very valuable um, addition um, to the discussion. Um, so um, with this, I would like to open one last time to anybody that would be interested to um, raise a question in regards to either the first part of the discussion that we had today in regards to the regulatory environment and the legal frameworks. Um, uh, and or uh, the data governance um, topics that are there. So uh, I'll be counting a little bit down. Uh, three, two, one. If this is not the case, um, then I would like to now um, get to uh, basically again the question of the how um, that Nana uh, was emphasizing and to, to summarize a little bit the discussion that we had today. Um, because um, really, uh, we've heard today from uh, our speakers from um, Africa, from Latin America, but also uh, from other regions of the world that um, there are different um, speeds, so to speak, of some of the uh, activity surrounding the regulatory frameworks or uh, data governance uh, approaches, but uh, all of them have embarked upon actually implementation stages. And um, there is this big question that surrounds um, the notion of terminology and making sure that terminology is something we are tackling more consciously um, and use this as this harmonizing and unifying uh, factor, which is no challenge uh, uh, that uh, is not uh, possible to be solved, but it's one that needs um, attention. Um, this, of course, links then to the inclusivity um, that th through it, this uh, would be achieved, not only in regards to the translation between languages, but also to a certain extent the translation between knowledge silos, schools of thought, and also within governments, within regions, and uh, on a global scale. Uh, we also heard uh, when we embarked on the data policy uh, discussion um, in the last half hour uh, about the importance of some of the exercises um, that underline the notion of interoperability of frameworks and of the data flows um, that are there. Uh, and also the question on how we can counter this lack of trust uh, to ensure this full-fledged accountability, hopefully, to put something in place that uh, really resembles what we ideally would call a sustainable uh, digital transformation. So in regards to the how, I mean, again, the multi-stakeholder perspective is of utmost importance because um, 
you've seen it here. This was just an hour and a half. Um, those were two major regions of the world. And these perspectives are so diverse, but so important to actually be amplified that um, it's really a shame that we don't have more of these opportunities to talk to each other and uh, to keep exchanging uh, on this, um, hopefully soon enough uh, in person again. So um, what I would like to then spend the next five minutes on um, yet again is to underline um, the two main projects that are currently taking place uh, either in collaboration with you and ECLAC or uh, taking place in collaboration with partners in, in Africa from the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network, where we are trying to at least play a little role on the how, um, and in particular to also now again emphasize that there are very concrete opportunities for any practitioner listening in, being in the room, to actively engage on how we solve the how. So um, it's already been said by Fernando and by Georgina from, from UNSEPA that we've embarked on the development of a status report um, that also helped support some of the policy environment questions related to a digital common market uh, in, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. We were extremely thankful um, also that the reaction in the region on the report was very positive to the extent that we would like also to mention the great work that has been done by our colleagues at the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, CGIBR, with whom we've been uh, collaborating recently. Um, and uh, they, for example, stepped forward and uh, enabled uh, the full-fledged translations of all of the documents that have been developed into Portuguese to ensure that a very engaged and traditionally very informed audience in Brazil that was active in the internet governance uh, discussions ever since the World Summit on the Information Society in Rio could also inclusively engage in um, these new findings uh, from that point of view. Similar uh, story goes in the direction of the, of the Spanish translations that were achieved there. Uh, we also recently had the pleasure um, to uh, contribute to a summer school that was convened by, uh, the, uh, uh, by, by UNECLAC. Um, where also we discuss similar uh, topics to what we've been discussing today and try to ensure that um, this knowledge that is being shared is also being used to actually build capacity with active practitioners that will go back then to their day-to-day -day work and hopefully will uh, internalize uh, some of these you know, cutting edge observations from a global and regional uh, point of view. So um, that's what is taking place in Latin America and Caribbean at this stage. And we are in advanced and active discussions to see to what extent we could now dock also potential capacity building uh, mechanics or maybe uh, updates to the observations we made in the past in the region. Um, and uh, the methodology of this will follow the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy network methodology of being crowdsourced. So uh, once we have something to announce, we'll do so actively. And anybody can become a contributor or an active uh, uh, knowledge uh, sharer uh, for these documents. Um, and uh, we will include them, um, in most cases, uh, if this is requested, by non-attributing them. Also to ensure here that uh, nobody feels restricted in sharing some of the also informal data uh, that we need to write these documents. And uh, to, to finish also up, um, we, uh, as we've mentioned, have embarked upon a full-fledged uh, initiative to provide a little bit the connective tissue between the amazing uh, initiatives that are already taking place in Africa. We will participate in, the, in a session in the African IGF uh, on the 14th, so next week, to also try to again amplify perspectives there. And uh, we'll also on the Monday uh, next week, so on the 13th, uh, conduct a first workshop of a what we call knowledge dialogue where we have invited uh, African uh, stakeholders and experts to help us crowdsource the priorities for what they believe the status report on cross-border digital policies should cover in Africa. And uh, this first workshop will be followed by a second edition where we will then uh, extend this also to representatives from the Global North so that we have at least this dialogue. And Fernando and uh, Georgina, we would be extremely pleased if we could also ensure again uh, this global south-south uh, exchange uh, which was so extremely uh, helpful also in uh, making i think us understand the particularities um, in each uh, jurisdiction 
uh, and then this will uh, basically uh, manifest itself in a status report that we hope to be able to launch uh, then in time for the global IGF uh, that will hopefully will take place for the first time on the African continent uh, in Ethiopia in the second half of next year and then also learning modules that will uh, be developed out of that. So uh, let me please apologize for this long monologue and for this little uh, pitch at the end, uh, but I hope you appreciate that, um, you know, uh, this is very much um, trying to convey the wide network that is behind us that really tries to now actively work on the how, not only to discuss, but to very actively come together, develop terminologies, glossaries, and really make sure that everything that we also discussed today uh, is amplified into the right direction so that it's taken into account actively because uh, as many of you said we don't have much time to spare so um, with this i would like to once again thank so much all of our distinguished speakers all of you that uh, stuck with us until the end of the session also for the ones of you uh, who made it to Katowice in, uh, I don't know if you have snow there, uh, but it's certainly cold in, in, in Śląsk uh, in the south, as I'm half Polish, so uh, I'm quite, quite, <laughs> quite traumatized still uh, by the Polish weather. But um, I hope you enjoy uh, the city. Thank you so much for having virtually uh, joined us here, and uh, we can't wait to engage with you uh, in other fora, and also warmly invite you to engage in any of the activities that you've heard about today from us or from all of the speakers and partners uh, that have talked here. And yes, Nana, Polish food is very good, but it's all potato. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but yeah, nothing against it. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Wishing you a lovely rest of the evening or day, depending on your time zone.